Um, is Sally Dominguez. Sally is a futurist. She's an author. She's an inventor. She's a creative resilience expert. And today she's going to be talking about global interaction of energy, water, and climate. So please help me in welcoming Sally Dominguez. Devon, welcome on now. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, awesome to be here. The Austin event was amazing. This one is I'm particularly passionate about because it brings together the nexus, of course, of water and energy. Um, and my aim here is twofold. Firstly, to provoke you into the kind of mindset that gets those conversations heading towards the adjacent opportunity area, right? We're all really good at certain things. But if you meet one person who is good at something you're not good at and together you jam for 15 minutes on what could happen, if you put those things together in that kind of unexpected connection that is the bedrock of innovation, awesome and amazing things could come from this conference. And considering my expertise is in coaching on moonshot thinking, that's what I'm hoping you will all do this entire time. So you can see here, even though it says future energy landscape, in fact, both of these things exist right now. You might be asking yourself, it's impossible that the 1980s Scout Walker from the Star Wars film is existing right now, and I'll challenge you on that, because I'm going to show you what is existing right now that potentially is even more fantastical than the Scout Walker was back in the day. But the other environment you see behind you is Burning Man, another thing that exists right now. And just out of curiosity, and because we're in California, do we have burners in the room? Do we have Burning Man, Burning Man? Excellent, fantastic. So, just, you don't have to listen to what I have to say, you know. But what I want to talk really about is um, this, this post-COVID realization of the importance of human connection and the importance of human connection in what you're all doing. Bottoms up innovation, circular economy at micro scale as well as at utility scale. So without further ado, let's crack into this. I've got a little video. But my bad, I'm not very technological, even though I talk about technology, and it's starting late. So I'm going to talk while it's on. Um, the reason that I'm showing this is to demonstrate that right now, so this concept was shown by Hyundai CES 2019. I'm currently working with them on a hydrogen fuel cell concept car that may or may not be amphibious, depending on how ambitious we get. Um, but this thing is actually in development in LA right now. And so we will be seeing walking cars and not just one mode of walking like the Scout Walker. This thing has three modes. You can imagine that there will be an engine in each wheel. I'd like to think it will be a hydrogen fuel cell car. It will have incredible capabilities. If superhighways develop with all the autonomous vehicles and the rest of the place is left desolate, we will be needing really good suspension and maybe this is what you'll be driving. Right, so my point is this, that we are in this massive disruption of the fourth revolution, right? And that means the rise of machine intelligence, the rise of exponential technologies, I think I'm stopping, just gonna keep on playing. <laughs> the rise of exponential technologies and specifically the rise of machine intelligence. And if machine intelligence can predict, analyze and spot behavioral change more than 30 times faster at this minute, than the fastest, snappiest human brain, what does that leave us to do as humans? It's about our unique ability to imagine, create, and then make those unexpected connections. And so it's never been more important for every person to understand their ability to think creatively at exponential scale, have huge visions, knowing that the technology to realize those visions has never been more accessible or affordable, and it will only continue to be more so. We're in an exponential era, and that means we need to think at a different scale. So back to Burning Man. And the reason I bring Burning Man up is it is a really interesting circular system. Um, I've been going for 13 years, and there's something that I've observed that I think is super relevant to today. So a lot of town planners study Burning Man because it's now 80,000 people come to an inhospitable, desiccated landscape that is also of great geological value. Um, basically on the premise that you will have radical self-reliance and you will leave no trace. So people arrive here, they set up a city for a week, it's incredibly proactive, and then they disappear and they take everything with them. Now the leave no trace 
um, is kind of summarized as the stuff that hits the ground, this very delicate environment, is called moop, matter out of place. So people will come in with all their food, they'll come in with their water, all their stuff, and then they will diligently clean up and schlep everything they brought, their trash, their garbage, last year at the Renegade Burn, their human waste. They will take everything back out with them. They'll even clean up the burn scars, right? Because we want to leave no trace, and this is awesome. Um, I have been doing it in a tent, now I'm doing it in a shift pod, so it's a pop-up yurt. I've got 150 watt solar, and that runs my Nespresso coffee machine, and also my ceiling fan in my tent. Right, so this year it went to 120 degrees. Now what I've noticed over the couple of years that things have been slowly changing is that it is stinking hot, more and more people are coming, and the matter out of place thing and the whole radical self-reliance thing didn't ever specifically address air pollution. Now over the years we've seen more and more RVs, and an RV of course is a tin can, and if it sits in the sun it gets really hot. So this is now about people are running more and more generators to run the air conditioning, right? Technically, the water runoff from that shouldn't even hit the plier. That would be the aim, but probably is. Right, so this year when I got there, not only is there generator bars nonstop, everybody has their AC on, but now everyone's got an e-bike or an e-scooter because if you have the generator there running on all that fuel that you've trailed in now, you might as well have an e-bike because it's really hot and you really want to pedal. So all the town rules around you've got to be on a pedal vehicle and no cars and all these things are kind of being slipped around by the fact that it has been acceptable, regardless of leaving no trace, to churn out fossil fuel burning generator gunk into the air. And as I was there this year with these industrial sized generators, feeling very righteous with my solar power and thinking, this is crazy. We have a very pointy end population who proactively try to make this as circular as possible. So if, and I firmly believe, if the organisation were to say there shall be no fossil fuel burning generators, unless you're running an electric vehicle for a disabled person, there shall be none, then I believe we would see an explosion in incredible technology around direct solar air conditioning, around all sorts of other solar use, people would have electric generators and they would generally come up with much better ways to have their energy. You'd also see a decline in the e-bikes and the scooters because you really do need a massive generator to power that, right? And where was the self-reliance? So this is going somewhere. You know, this had me thinking about the power of making a couple of basic regulations and the power of people who essentially are proactive, particularly younger generations. I mean, I'm not discounting the oldies like myself, right? I'm super proactive, I bet you all are too. But we're seeing from the under 25s, Gen Z, the famous Gen Z, a demand to be part of the process, a demand to be part of the solution. They want to co-create with you. So then I was thinking about air conditioning. Right? The other thing about air conditioning is it churns up a lot of energy. Now I read that in the last lot of heat waves, LA was concerned that 25% of the housing units in the city don't have AC and they get dangerously hot, particularly when they're apartments, right? So we're going to have to start handing out AC, and this disproportionately affects the lower income people, which is also unacceptable. So if you have a look at some of the stats, that air conditioning use is about to go crazy. And then you consider that when we're air conditioning, we're also producing water. And you know, depending on the air conditioning, it's pretty clean water actually. I think that there is an opportunity to harness community. Harness community at every level to make these small differences to add up to big things. Because essentially the sharing economy exists not just for profit, but because people love the connection. And they love to not waste, particularly Americans. You guys are particularly good at looking at waste, even though you waste a ton, of not wanting to waste a ton, right? Let's be frugal if we can. So here we have, and this is a bit of a shameless um, ad for a thing that I designed a while ago, but I don't actually handle it anymore. But this is my rainwater hog tank. This thing was specifically designed in Australia in 2005 to hold grey water and act as thermal mass in the walls of lightweight dwellings. Um, needless to say, in 2005, nobody even understood what that would do, and it just became a rainwater harvesting tank. And then it came over here and it won a heap of awards, and now I've made here in California. Um, here we have Starbucks, as of last year, is harnessing the 200 gallons or so that they get of runoff every day 
from their water purification machine that adjust the pH of dodgy LA water to make sure that it tastes like every other Starbucks cup of coffee. Right, so they decided to have a green initiative and harness all that water, and they have so much that they can flush the toilets and still put it on the garden every day. Right, and here we have a couple of other hogs from years ago that are doing our air conditioning runoff in Hawaii where there's tons of air conditioning and there's tons of runoff. And ironically, even though it feels really tropical and moist, it's not. Parts of it are really dry. So it occurred to me, you know, if we want to start circular, should we not be giving small portable solar air conditioners to all the people that don't have them, along with a collection vessel to help people understand what circularity looks like and what this could be? You know, if we start at the bottom and go, you do, need air conditioning, but let's not use all that energy. Let's cut through the energy use, and at the same time, let's acknowledge that if we're pulling water from the air, that water needs to go somewhere, and not just dribble off in a tray and drop off into the drains. So that's my first thought for the day. Just, I don't know, you've probably got this sorted, but maybe you don't. The key is, right, that right now, with exponential change, with this massive transformation throughout the world, in the rate of change, which is disrupting everything politically, economically, socially, we cannot base our decision making on assumptions that were based on a different time. I'm still, and this is controversial, firmly entrenched in the belief that the predictions for recession are all based on old school patterns. The fact that things are still, people are like, but this is happening, but you know that other thing that should be happening isn't happening. It's because the old patterns are no longer relevant to this rate of change. New patterns are coming. We just don't know what they are yet. And so as an example, if the milk lasts a week, why does the container last a year? Think about the assumptions around the packaging, the delivery of what we do, every piece of what we do. Here we have single serve olive oil. This is old now. This is 2012. There's two girls called Tomorrow Machine came out to rethink entirely packaging as a fully circular thing. Olive oil is packaged in heavy glass or tin because it oxidizes, right? So we don't want the sunlight to hit it, which makes it really heavy to transport, which makes it kind of a pain to package and recycle. But if you put it in caramelized sugar with a little bit of beeswax around the outside, around the outside, all of a sudden you can crack it like an egg, transport it like an egg, and then throw the wrapping away. So this is the kind of thinking we need. And I found this one just the other day that I think is a bit snappy. I don't have a timer, so give me a wave when it's five. Just, I don't think I'm, yeah, right. Okay, this thing is a, is a Russian prototype, and I like it because they put a layer of chemical, now before you kick me, and I was with a bunch of chemical scientists yesterday, so you know, I had this for them too to make them feel better. This has a layer of chemical, and when you pull the tab, the very packaging cooks the egg. Now imagine the energy saving if we were to re-examine packaging and say, if the packaging is necessary, what else can it do to cut into energy to make it more useful or more long-lasting? And even though I can't quite find what the chemical is that's in that cardboard, I did refer it back to the Kareem Rashid baby bottle. So my first invention, call it invention, it's actually a design, but one that's in a lot of museums now, was actually a baby high chair. It's called Nest. It pioneered a couple of new things. Um, shortly afterwards, this baby bottle, that's the insert, came out. And even though it's ridiculously wasteful, it's kind of interesting because he has this cartridge that goes up into the bottom of it that has water and calcium chloride. And when it's activated, it heats up the contents. So right at the time, that was like, that's pretty cool. We could do things with that. And I utterly feel that if we're going to create packaging that lasts longer than the stuff inside it, should the packaging not take a piece of that energy calc and help in some way to be a more useful thing. So here I'm gonna hit on some circular economy, just some work that I did and some people at my breaking table this morning heard me say I'm very bullish. What are we, five? Not even five, we're done. Are we actually done? Okay, I'll go for two, all right. Um, this is a circular hydrogen roadmap I created. Found some technology that produces hydrogen from salt water with less than 40 kilowatt hours of solar. Um, then took the brine and said, because this was the Caribbean, we can actually make sodium ion batteries from that brine. 
Big fan of sodium iron, but I didn't stop there. I also said if we do offshore wind, we can create artificial reefs with the foundations, which will bring prolific lobsters, as it turns out. So we can actually have abundancy in more than energy. We can have abundancy in energy, energy storage, and fisheries and tourism. So I'm just going to whip through. You'll get my slides later, and I've gone over, which I didn't mean to do. But just in case you're hating on hydrogen, I want to just show you a theory I have that will create an almost immediate hydrogen highway and solve some of the water problems across this country. And that is this. That same technology, less than 40 kilowatt hours of solar per kilo of hydrogen, works even better with human waste. If we were to take every single waste processing plant and create hydrogen from it, we could either use that energy to process the waste and then have water, just gotta put a bit of salt in because actually it's pure water, right? Or we could have a hydrogen superhighway by simply revaluing waste and turning it into an energy source. That's my proposal to provoke you for the day. There's a little bit of storage. I also firmly believe in metal, metal um, hydrogen storage, material storage, not pipeline, but that's for another day. This is the most important piece. So when you're considering what you could do together, when you're partnering with unexpected people during this conference, remember, it's not what you know now and the restrictions of your knowledge it's actually look for the technology that would enable you to realize that stuff at scale. A little bit of wave, you can look at that later. This is really important, so I would love you to read it in your own time. But my other piece that goes with efficiency versus equity is if we had battery swap as a widespread solution, rather than relying on super efficient batteries, we could have more sodium iron, more affordable options. If we retrofit under every car a pack of batteries, we don't need to be spending the crazy amount on lithium that we do and creating that geopolitical nightmare that is coming our way. So with that, I'm gonna smash through because I went too long on my Burning Man stuff. I want you to have a think about that at some point and let's just stop with this. So this conference is all about you all coming together coming up with the massive visions that will move things firmly forward. And I would encourage you when you do that to think about how can I include community? How can I ask generations of people, communities of people to be a huge and immediate part of this solution and help proliferate it with greater impact? All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much.